for me, it's quite hard to see how Ukraine can prevail. Hello and welcome to Offscript. My name is Stephen Edgington. On the 24th of February 2022, Russian forces rolled into Ukraine, starting one of the bloodiest wars Europe has seen in decades. Almost a year on from that invasion, I'm joined by Colonel Richard Kemp to discuss what happened and what could happen next. Were you surprised at the Russian invasion of Ukraine last year? I don't think it came as a surprise because it was quite widely predicted as Russia mobilised. Um, and that, that process took quite a long time with Russian troops building up on the border, which I'm sure everyone will remember that happening. And, and actually, at a relatively early stage of that process, British intelligence, US intelligence and other intelligence services were predicting a Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, and pretty much unfolded as it was predicted. So from that point of view, it didn't come as a surprise. In the bigger picture of things, I think it's been well known for many years now that Vladimir Putin had his eye on Ukraine. He obviously had a bite at it in 2014, um, and, but, it, but it, you know, he didn't make any secret of the fact that he considered Ukraine, or certainly a very large part of Ukraine, to be Russian territory and Russian property. So from that point of view, if anyone, anyone who was watching Putin and understanding the way his mind worked and what he had in mind, I think uh, would, have, would have not been overly surprised by the invasion. Do you think that Putin and Biden vastly underestimated the strength of the Ukrainian army? I think um, the, the, uh, not so much the strength of the Ukrainian army, I think, I think they underestimated perhaps um, had that the Ukrainian army were, and, and Ukrainian government in particular were willing to resist Putin. And that surprised Putin as well, of course, more than, probably more than Biden and, and the whole of the West. Um, but I think, you know, the, 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 the strength of the Ukrainian army came, it wouldn't have lasted very long, in my opinion, without very quick Western support. And a lot of that Western support um, came from Britain, of course, uh, very early on. I think we were, we were, if not the first, we were one of the leaders, uh, as well as Eastern European countries, in backing up Ukraine. And I'm not underestimating at all Ukraine's fighting capability or their tenacity or their, their courage in standing up to what, 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 what is a far bigger, bigger uh, neighbour than themselves. Um, but, but I think without that Western support, both in terms of military support, financial support, and also pretty early on indications of Western resolve, including imposition of sanctions uh, and other measures against, against Russia. So I, I, think, uh, I, I think that they, they, may, they may have been surprised at the, um, the net effect of all of that, both the Ukrainian fighting capability and spirit and also the, uh, the effect, of, you know, the, the unity to an extent at least of the West. I think the uh, one, one thing that shouldn't have surprised Biden was that that, um, that Putin decided to attack. And I think many people after the American-led withdrawal from Afghanistan a few months beforehand um, predicted that this would embolden um, people like Putin, people like China, President Xi. Um, and, 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 and I believe that, that that withdrawal led directly to Putin's decision. I think if NATO had not shown such weakness America and NATO, and, and including Britain, had not shown such weakness over Afghanistan. I think he might have had second thoughts before taking such a big step as that. So do you think that Putin was fooled on the political will of the Ukrainian government, as you say, to resist? Because he may have been, or there's sort of accusations that he's in this kind of bubble with people telling him what he wants to hear, and he was sort of fooled by his own security services and intelligence as to the extent to um, that the Ukrainian government would be willing to, to fight back and not just immediately flee. And there's also this idea of you know, the Russians being welcomed as liberators by many Ukrainians. Yeah. But again, that turned out to be completely false. Yeah. A lot of that, 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 all of those issues come down to, um, to a couple of things. First of all, Putin was determined to take Ukraine at some point, not necessarily exactly then, but he was determined to do that. Um, and his advisors, he's got a very small number of close advisors on military and intelligence issues and strategic issues. Um, and whatever their competence level is, they, um, they want to tell him what he wants to hear. 
So if he wanted to invade Crimea, uh, sorry, Ukraine, um, and he asked them what the, what the chances were, what the perspective was, they would tell him to a very large extent what he wanted to hear. It's, it's a classic um, failing of, of many dictators, any of the non-dictators around the world, lead, leaders generally. Um, so I think, I think uh, that was one aspect. Another aspect was that, um, and, and it kind of applies to the whole Russian situation in Ukraine, the, 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 there was a great deal of effort put in by Russia to collecting intelligence on Ukraine in terms of its fighting capability, its political, the likelihood of its political will to resist, the attitude of, of Ukrainian people towards a Russian invasion. Um, huge, amount, huge amount of resources invested in that. In theory, in practice, it doesn't work that way because like so much else in Russia, corruption uh, dominates and money and resources that were supposed to be put into intelligence actually went into the pockets of the various people along the chain, whether it's the heads of the intelligence agencies or whatever. Um, but it didn't, as much as should have done, didn't go into understanding Ukraine. And I think that that kind of reinforced, if anything, the kind of yes minister type attitude of, um, of uh, Putin's advisers. And, 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 and they, they grossly underestimated um, Ukraine's perspective. And I think, as I said just before, we're emboldened as well by, by uh, the apparent weakness of the West. Now, Ukraine in 2014, also Ukraine, uh, as well as Russia, is, is a corrupt country. It's got its own problems there. And in 2014, when Russia did invade Crimea, the government collapsed. It was a complete catastrophe. It was very chaotic. The Ukrainian armed forces were not prepared for that. Um, and there, you know, if, if Putin had invaded in, in 2014, maybe it would have been a different story. Can you describe the difference in the Ukrainian armed forces and perhaps even government structures from 2014 to 2022? Yeah, I mean, one issue, of course, that we often forget about is that um, the 2014 invasion was uh, almost rubber stamped by the West, but particularly by France and Germany, and the US, of course, played their part um, in really saying, yeah, they've done this, we don't like it, but it's fine, you know, we, we, can, we can live with it and we carry on. And of course, that was another factor that, that uh, fed into Putin's later decision in 2022. Um, but also in the meantime, there was a great deal of effort uh, invested into Ukraine's armed forces. The neighbor Poland played a part, Britain played a major part in providing some equipment and also training and advising the Ukrainian forces, as of course did America and other countries. So they were in a completely different state um, by 2022 when Russia invaded. And I think that, 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 that investment in Ukrainian forces played a significant role in their ability to, to hang on in the face of a full-scale Russian invasion. Now, Putin assumed that he could take Kiev very, very quickly in the opening stages of the war. Why do you think he failed to do so? Well, I think, again, it comes down to his appreciation of the likelihood of resistance, which we spoke about just now. Um, that, that he, he, he underestimated the, the likelihood of Ukraine resisting. And he, I think what he thought and his plans revolved around just by invading, just by the physical act of pushing large numbers of Russian troops into Ukraine and firing ballistic missiles into Ukraine, he thought that would be enough and the government would collapse. And, and, and the army, of course, if the government collapses, what's the army going to do? So that was his, I think, his expectation and it was plan A and probably it was plan B and C as well, because I don't think he had any uh, expectation that something else would happen. Um, so it's, it's really the, the, the resistance of Ukraine is, is a key issue. This, the, the other key issue is the, what I believe to be the appalling performance of the Russian army throughout the whole invasion, including at the very beginning. They didn't go in with enough troops. They didn't have enough combat power to achieve their objective if there was resistance. They did if there wasn't resistance, which is what they're expecting. But with heavy resistance, they didn't have enough. And, they, and the troops proved themselves to be not only inadequate in numbers, but also incompetent militarily. Um, and that again come, and, and not, not only I think were, did they plan to send too few troops in, but I don't think they realized that, that, that even fewer troops went in than they thought were going in. I'm talking about the Russians. And, Again, it comes down to the same thing. You know, there were there were tank crews which uh, were less than fully manned, half manned in some cases. There were infantry units which had far less than 
their required manpower levels in them, the established manpower levels. So if an infantry unit, say, has a thousand men in it, they maybe had 600 or something like that. And they didn't, they, in the Kremlin, they didn't realize this. Um, and and the, the equipment wasn't very good. The equipment was not properly maintained. There weren't enough spare parts to make. If you're, if you're fighting with armored vehicles in particular, you need huge amount of logistic backup, fuel, spare parts, the ability to repair tanks and armored vehicles when they break down. And that simply wasn't in place adequately for the requirement. And again, that comes down to corruption, because if a unit is supposed to have a thousand, it's got a thousand on paper and a thousand soldiers are paid, but there are only 600 there. And so 400 soldiers worth of pay goes into someone else's pocket. Uh, and of course, that wasn't really, I don't think properly, as understood as well as it should have been in the Kremlin, which, which helped to account for that. Um, and, 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 and the maintenance, you know, things like spare parts, spare parts for tanks, spare parts for trucks, these were not where they should have been. They'd been they, the money had been provided, they weren't purchased, they weren't pushed forward to be, uh, to be used. And I think I'm right in saying um, that around half of the total number of Russian tanks that have been taken out of the battle during this conflict since the beginning, about half of them were not destroyed by Ukrainian anti-tank missiles or artillery or anything else. They were, they, they ran out of fuel, they broke down because there weren't the parts to repair them, they were in bad state of disarray. So that, and that's, a, that's a huge number, half, um, due to in, unserviceability. In my experience, I spent a, lo a long time uh, on armoured warfare, both in the first Gulf War and in training either side of the first Gulf War in, in tanks and, and armoured infantry vehicles. Um, and I would say that, you know, that they are pretty unreliable. But you could count, I would say, if, they, if, if you're fighting a war and you put the resources into maintaining them, you, you should be able to count on probably around about an 80 to 90 percent reliability of those vehicles or repairability if they break down or become unserviceable. Um, but, you know, 50 percent is, is unheard of, I think, completely un, 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 uh, you know, unprecedented. But in some ways, that didn't really surprise me too much. I don't want to sound like a, a great prophet, of course, I'm not. But but I I I've, I saw quite a bit of the the, the Russian the so the Soviet Union's armed forces in Germany during the Cold War, and they were this great, huge, great fighting machine that was going to overwhelm the West in a matter of days. But if you actually looked at their forces, uh, uh, they were in disarray. They they were in very bad repair. They were in a, um, you know, they, they were rotting away in there. These are vehicles that were supposed to be shooting west when when uh, the Soviets decided to invade. So that was the case right back then. We're talking now, sort of in the 80s, um, and it doesn't look to me as if much has changed since those days. Uh, and, and 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 the other factor, which also was evident back in the 80s, was um, the morale of the Russian troops. Um, and I think that's, that is, you know, I think, I hate to quote a Frenchman, but, um, but Napoleon said that uh, in, in war, morale is three times as important as all other factors combined, which is, in my experience, is, is true. Um, you know, you can have the most powerful army, you can have the best equipment, most advanced, sophisticated stuff, but if the troops who are supposed to be fighting, if their will is not in it, if their heart is not in it, then it's going to be much, much less effective. And I think that's what we saw with the Russian forces as well, extremely low morale. And that was evident, I say, back in the 80s. You could see they were just a shambles and a shower. Um, didn't look as if they were ready to fight, and I think we saw that in Ukraine as well. And this issue of morale could be impacted by various different things. So, you know, for the Ukrainians, they, they're defending their homeland against an invasion, so there's, an, in, there's already an advantage there. For the Russians, the Russian troops, they weren't told that this was going to be an invasion. They were just told that they were going on exercises when they were sort of preparing on the Ukrainian border. And things like access to hot meals and, um, you know, sort of comfort and all of these other things that may be lacking. C can you describe some of those things that may have impacted the Russian morale in a sort of negative way? Yeah, you're absolutely right about Ukraine, mor Ukrainian morale, and we see that right to this very day. They have their problems, of course, like every army does. but. I think morale, fighting morale, probably isn't one of them because they've got their backs to the wall. They're fighting to defend their families, their home, their country, and the, their comrades who you know, are fighting alongside them. And that, that's the, a key boost for morale compared to the Russians who, as you say, they, they, they didn't even know they were going to be there or why they were going to be there. 
And again, it reminded me somewhat of, of the first Gulf War in 1991 when you know, many Iraqis just surrendered, gave up, not because they couldn't fight, though some of them could fight, not all of them, but because they didn't want to fight. They had no reason to fight. They didn't think, they didn't have any idea why they were fighting. Um, and and in, in, in the case of the Russians, um, you know, many of them, many, many parts of the Russian army, including the new, newly mobilized troops, um, they, they, they come from far flung parts of Russia, of the Russian Federation. And many of them don't even have any allegiance to Russia. Uh, that, you know, they come from perhaps Siberia or somewhere long way from Moscow, don't have any, you know, who's this guy Putin? We, 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 we know who he is, but, you know, why would we fight for him and why would we fight for Russia? We don't really, we may consider ourselves broadly Russian, but not with the kind of level of allegiance that you would need, I think, to fight hard for your country. A bit like, again, a bit like the, um, the Afghan National Army, which had no real allegiance to Kabul, didn't see themselves as Afghans. Their allegiance was tribal. And, and hence, when they came under, they fought very bravely in many cases and took a huge number of casualties. But, but when, the, when it came to the crunch, that their army pretty much collapsed. Um, and and I, the, the Russian army is obviously not on the verge of collapse as far as I can see. Obviously, it's had pr problems. But the, 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 the various factors you mentioned, like you know welfare, what food you're getting, whether you've got the right equipment and, and clothing and all of these sort of things, very, very important. But I think even more important than any of that is leadership. Leadership is probably, in, in any military organization, is the fundamental issue that determines the effectiveness of that organization. And I think we've seen many examples of failures in Russian leadership. I don't, you know, they don't lead in the same way that we do, perhaps all the Americans do. In other words, lead from the front, lead by example. They, they, you know, they're basically drivers who drive their troops forward and, and, and actually in, within the Russian mentality broadly, it's not, it's not, you know, you don't really care too much about your troops. You just, you know, you, you're just there. You, you want to keep yourself, um, some, some probably pretty brave Russian commanders as well, but nevertheless, it's not, it's not the same extent of leadership. And if, if you're not well led, then you can't, in my view, be expected to fight well. Do you think that Russian commanders have sort of used this tactic throughout history, Russian military history, of, of just throwing wave after wave of their troops and having a sort of disregard for the lives of their soldiers in order to, to wipe out the enemy. I mean, we've seen this in, in, in individual street battles in various different Ukrainian towns and cities. Mm. Is this perhaps Western propaganda saying this or is there a, some truth in that? No, I think, I think there's truth in it. And I think that, you know, you have to look at the battles of the Second World War. Um, and there you can see Russian soldiers being thrown away in vast, vast numbers, sometimes completely unnecessarily, because it doesn't really matter. You've got plenty more where they came from. And actually, maybe as a commander, you don't really care too much what, what ha whether they live or die. Obviously, there are exceptions to that, but broadly speaking. Um, and, and I think, you know, again, going back to the, the leadership issue, uh, uh, for a soldier to, 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 to fight hard and effectively and give that bit extra, and maybe risk his own life beyond what he needs to do, which is sometimes necessary in war, I think he needs to be confident that his commander actually cares about his life and won't do things that are unnecessarily going to result in him being killed. And again, I've seen in, in various different places, I've seen examples of how sol soldiers are impacted by commanders that really don't care about them. And, and if that, you know, again, if the commanders don't care about them, why should they do their best to make sure the commander's plan is carried through? Can we talk about, we've talked about some of the mistakes the Russians have made, and maybe there are more mistakes that you want to mention, but can we also talk about some of the potential mistakes the Ukrainians have made and the, and the West has made? Yeah, I, on, on the Russian side, I think, what, just to conclude on that, I think the, what, what we've seen is an a, a apparent lack of ability to conduct what are termed combined arms operations, in other words, combining ground forces, uh, arm, you know, or infantry, armour, artillery, aircraft, uh, and these days, you know, cyber operations, satellite coverage, etc., to, to actually combine these things to make the whole much greater than the combination of all of the parts. Um, and that's, uh, that's something that is slightly mystifying, I think, because, the, you know, the Russians have got very strong combined arms doctrine, 
um, which has been exhibited from you know parts of the Second World War right the way through the Cold War to today. But they don't see, didn't seem to be implementing it properly. And maybe they, they, again, maybe it comes down to not spending enough money on training and you know going into someone's pocket. I don't know. But um, as far as the Ukrainians are concerned, I think um, the one, one of their greatest successes has been based on. And again, I don't. I, I'm not in any way attempting to undermine or to to, to cast doubt on their fighting ability, but. In war, uh, the most not the most important factor, one of the most important factors is intelligence. Um, and Ukraine has been extremely fortunate in benefiting from Western intelligence, intelligence from Britain, intelligence from the US and other countries, um, which has given them a really big edge, I think, over the Russians. I think the intelligence provided by our countries to Ukraine has been vastly superior to the intelligence that the Russians have got on Ukraine. Uh, and you can see that, you can see that uh, exhibited by, for example, the large number of Russian commanders that have been taken out of action, generals, a lot of them, I've lost count, but a lot. And, and that, a lot of that comes down to the ability to pinpoint their location through electronic intelligence. Uh, and also their, the ability of the Ukrainians to, to locate Russian logistics bases and, and supply depots and things, and then attack them on the basis of that intelligence. So I think that that's a, an edge that they've definitely had. And in terms of the errors they've made, um, I think it's, you know, the, it, it's actually quite hard. The, the have been, there have been errors. And if you look at, for example, um, the, the battle that's going on now in Bakhmut, um, it's, you know, the Ukrainians decided to fight hard for Bakhmut and they've taken vast numbers of casualties. The Russians have also taken casualties there, significant numbers. But I think it's had a really horrific effect on, on the strength of the Ukrainian army. And you could ask the reason why. And, and there are different arguments for that. And we won't, don't want to go into detail on it particularly. But I think you know, an argument is that um, to hold onto Bakhmut and absorb Russian attacks in Bakhmut may have been preferable to withdrawing from Bakhmut, letting them have it, and then defending against Russian attack from other positions, which may be weaker than the prepared positions in Bakhmut. So that, that, you know, it's hard to know whether that was the right decision or not, but I think m my inclination is to think it probably wasn't because it has cost Ukraine so many casualties. Bakhmut is not a particularly strategically important place. And I believe that that's why the Russians, people were saying, why are the Russians just constantly attacking Bakhmut? Because it's, they're not really getting very far. It's been months since last autumn. Um, and I think the reason was, the calculation there was that this is where we can kill very, very large numbers of Ukrainians, and, and that has been correct. The spring counteroffensive is, is potentially coming up, and, and you know, you've written for the Telegraph about that. We're going to get on to what you think may happen later on, but last year there was a, another counteroffensive by the Ukrainians, which was successful against the Russians in the north of Ukraine and, and partly in, around Kurzon in the mm. south of Ukraine. Why was that successful what was the what made that work well the 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 uh, the offensive around the area of Kharkov and in, in Kherson uh, were both pretty they were pretty successful both of them um, and achieved a lot I, I don't believe it was because the Ukrainians defeated the Russians in either of those places my understanding of what happened there the Ukrainians fought hard they 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 showed you know quite uh, a, a quite impressive manoeuvre aptitude in moving forces and, and supplying forces over long distances. But they didn't actually have a... I don't think they defeated in either of those places the Russians by a kind of um, a major offensive. I think what happened was that the Russians saw them come, saw what was coming, as they would have done, and, and withdrew their forces rather than fight there. And, and the idea in both, in both cases, both Kherson and, and Kharkov, and, and my view is the reason for that was that they wanted to basically trade space for time because they, they when Kharkov started, I don't think they'd even commenced their mobilization program or had only just. Um, and it, when Kherson occurred, they were in it but hadn't generated sufficient numbers of troops. So they didn't, going back to what I said before, they didn't have enough troops to defend the whole of the front when the tables were turned on them. So they pulled forces back. They did some fighting, but not, not, not a really strong battle. 
So they pulled forces back to places that they could more easily defend. Um, and at the same time, buy the time for the mobilization. So they were willing to give up that territory in both cases. I, I've no doubt whatever that they considered that and still consider it today to be a, a, you know, a tactical movement that would then be reversed at some point and they would take that territory back. You've touched on it a lot throughout this interview, West, the impact that Western weapons have had on this war. Can you just summarise how, how you think that, that our sort of weaponry and technology has, has impacted the war? Yeah, I mean, I think it's had a... I believe that we would not be in the position we're in today, whether it's a good position to be in or a bad position, but we would not be in a position where Ukraine was still fighting had it not been for the West. Um, one, one factor, of course, is um, a fairly significant number of foreign troops coming in to fight for Ukraine, particularly from countries like Poland, but some also from you know, the UK and other countries, maybe not in the, in the case of our countries, huge numbers, but nevertheless, you know, every, every man is worth something. So these are like volunteers? Volunteers. And, and, you know, I think there's questions about how volunteer they were in the case of some and, and in the case of particularly of Polish uh, people who went to fight. But I, but I don't know and I don't think anything um, has come out about that. But, but, but I think, yeah, let's, let's say volunteers um, coming forward to, to, to play their part. And in fact, a soldier from my own regiment, the Royal Anglian Regiment, uh, was, was uh, a member of the Ukrainian army um, who was captured by the Russians at um, Mariupol. Um, and he just, you know, he, he I've, I've seen him since and he's told me about quite a large number of, of Western volunteers, including from Britain. Um, but that, you know, I'd, I'd say that is not, that none of that really was perhaps decisive. What has been decisive were the, uh, what the, the end laws and the other uh, portable anti-tank weapons that were provided to Ukraine, which took care of a large and, and helped blunt to the, the Russian armoured advances uh, very effectively. And the Russians, it comes back again to the fact that tanks, are, you know, people talk about the end of the tank because the Russians have lost a lot and the Ukrainians have lost a lot. But, but it's the way tanks are used rather than their actual uh, capabilities that is in question. And we saw, we saw the Russians because they had enough troops, they had enough infantry fighting on the ground to protect these tanks in areas where they're vulnerable, particularly wooded areas and urban areas. Um, but, but that aside, the, the, these, these uh, anti-tank missiles played a major part in the early stages. I think they were the, certainly among the first um, weapons that we provided them. And the other thing that I would say is pretty decisive were the, um, the MLRS um, and, and similar missiles, um, medium range um, ballistic missiles that were provided to um, Ukraine in large, in quite large numbers by Britain, the US and other countries. And where they were, they were effective in many different areas, but where, the, where I think they were most effective was on targeting the, um, uh, the, the logistics. And, and without, you know, any, any significant force, particularly an armoured force, cannot operate without strong logistics and Ukrainians were very successful at hitting those logistic locations. So those two things I think I would, I would say were pretty significant um, and, and I've mentioned it before but I think you know if anything at least as significant was the intelligence provided by us and the Americans and others to, to Ukraine which, which, which was undoubtedly a battle winner and on top of that you have uh, quite a few Western advisors out there helping the Ukrainians um, and, and, and they've, I think, you know, they, including British advisers, they have played a, a significant, whether it's advising from here or advising from there, we don't know, but played a very significant role in, uh, in, in the Ukrainians' tactics. Does this war remind you of any other throughout history and maybe even throughout your own career that you've been involved with? It's, I, I think in terms of my own career, um, it's, it's not really comparable. Uh, to any conflict, with the exception, perhaps, a little bit of, of the first Gulf War, which was basically conventional forces against conventional forces. Uh, pretty much all of the other wars I've been involved in have been you know, low-level guerrilla actions and terrorist attacks and things like that, that you know, counterinsurgency rather than conventional warfare. Um, and, and, and I don't think there are many really good comparisons between the first Gulf War and, and, and this war. 
but but I think in 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 the in the broader sense, um, the, you know, this this is the, the the most intensive and probably costly conflict since the Second World War, uh, and you just have to look at the number of casualties that have been inflicted on both sides, completely incomparable to any other conflict that we have. Um, we the West ha has fought since the Second World War. Things like even things like Vietnam and Afghanistan, Iraq, the Falklands War, all of these conflicts, uh, the, the the casualty rates uh, are, are incomparable to what's going on in Afghan on in Ukraine today. And you have to go back, I think, to the Second World War to see anything like it. Is this the first real twenty first century war where you have both sides relatively equal in terms of technology? They're both using drones. They're both using these new methods of warfare. Yeah, I think I think it probably is, and I think one thing it does show, in my view, is that the the new technology, things like drones, cyber, um, and some of the more you know um, precision missiles, uh, have not played as important a role as people would have thought. And you know, in Britain, for example, I think we, you know, we've obviously got se severe constraints on our defence budget, and some people have to prioritise. And I think we prioritised much more the new types of weaponry and technology and means of fighting war. For example, drones, artificial intelligence, cyber, and all this. Um, we prioritised that above hard combat power, and we diminished our hard combat power even more than it already was in order to fund the new type of weaponry. Um, now, the, the reality, in my opinion, is you can't do that. You need both. And therefore, you can't, you know, in, in the modern era, defence just costs so much more than it's ever cost before because you need the conventional capability, as we've seen from Ukraine, and you need the, you know, more, more modern technology as well. You need them both working together. Uh, and I'm not. I'm not saying that the drones and and other um, you know mod precision missiles etc. haven't played a part because they have played a part. And you know we've seen, for example, how um, you know quite large numbers of Iranian supplied drones have been have been used by um, Russia to attack, particularly attack uh, the towns and villages in Ukraine. And they've been quite devastating in some cases. Uh, on the other hand, many, many, many of them have been shot down. Um, and, and, and so I I, my, my view so far, and it's not just that I'm a dinosaur, but my view so far is that these, these new technologies have not had the decisive impact that many people expect. And I think if anything, it shows that, uh, you know, the, 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 perhaps as you call it, the first real 21st century war um, is being fought pretty significantly along the lines of 20th century wars. And one of the key issues there is artillery. The Russians um, have used artillery to immense e effect, and I'm talking not about precision missile or shells, or what, I'm talking about standard artillery, which they're churning out in huge numbers now, and they've co they've created vast amounts of casualties. Yeah, they're not accurate as not as accurate as other more modern stuff, but they are very very devastating. And artillery, I think, has been the major life taker on both sides probably in this war. And is that, does that go back to the Russian operations in the Middle East where they just flatten cities basically? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, they, they, they have no qualms about doing that and they don't care if they're killing civilians as well as soldiers or instead of soldiers, they, they, really, they, they really don't care. It doesn't come into their thinking. And they've shown that again in, in Ukraine as well. Um, but it's, uh, and, uh, you know, I think on, on both sides, that's been a major factor. And, and unfortunately, the Ukrainians, I think, are running quite short of artillery. And we're struggling to, we, the West, are struggling to resupply them with the extent they need. And, the, you know, the NATO Secretary General mentioned this recently. Let's talk about the upcoming potential counteroffensive. Uh, let's go back to really basic sort of military strategy history. Why... Do we think that the Russians are going to start a counteroffensive around the springtime? The, I, I think the reality is that Putin has no choice than to do that. You know, if it, it, we've currently got a situation, it's not stalemate exactly, but the, the, there's been a lot of fighting going on over the winter so far. 
but there's been not no real major strategic gains made by either side. Um, and, and Putin cannot allow that situation to continue. Um, you know, the devastation that has been brought on Russia by him and his decision to invade Ukraine in terms of vast numbers of casualties. Um, I mean, I don't know what the number of Russian casualties is. No, I don't think anyone does, but they're, they're very, very significant, as indeed are probably even more significant the Ukrainian casualties, because they've probably, I would guess, the Ukrainians have taken more casualties than the Russians, and they've got fewer soldiers and fewer people to, to turn into soldiers. Um, so, but that's one, one thing. And, and the, the economic damage that's been done to Russia, OK, the sanctions have not necessarily brought Russia to its knees, but they haven't helped Russia. Um, the, you know, the standing in the world of Russia, the, 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 the strengthening, if anything, of, the, of Russia's enemies, the US and NATO as a whole uh, in this conflict, has been basically handed to NATO, to the West by Russia. We, and think, you know, issues like Finland and um, Norway deciding to join or applying to join NATO. Um, you know, the, these are strengthening measures. Um, and, and, you know, various countries, at least, certainly Poland is dramatically increasing its defence spending and various other countries are, like Germany, have promised to do so. Whether we'll actually see anything coming of that, I don't know. But, but all this strengthened the West, and Putin, it's Putin, down to Putin, it's what Putin has brought about. Um, so, uh, you know, and, his, and the isolation of Russia in the world today, um, including, I think, uh, I would say, a diminishment of the Russian-Chinese relationship as a result of this. Um, so with all of that, he can't just say, OK, well, let's have a deal, and we'll go back to the February 2022 lines, and then, you know, leave it there and maybe negotiate something else in the future. He can't do that. I don't see how he can do that. He certainly can't uh, negotiate in any way that's going to make his possessions in Ukraine like Crimea any less than what occurred at the start of the war. So all of that means he's got to do, he's got to carry out major offensive operations against Ukraine and, uh, you know, I think do severe damage to the Ukrainian army and take large swathes of Ukrainian territory. And my guess is his ambition would be with his, what, what I think is likely to be a force. We've already seen the beginnings of an offensive operation, what they call in, in the armed forces, um, uh, shaping the battlefield is the term used. In other words, m making various offensive moves in preparation for a major offensive, which puts the, that, that operation in a, a good starting point. And that's been going on recently. Um, and I think his objective probably is at least to to secure the whole of the Donbass, at least, um, and to secure and consolidate as much of the south coast as he can. He'd certainly like to take Odessa, whether that's feasible at the, in the near future, I don't know. But, but, you know, in other words, to possess the whole of the coast along the Black Sea and deprive Ukraine of its ability to export and import on the coast, in other words, take its coastline away from it. And I, I, would, I would have said that, you know, by doing those two things, if he's able to, um, uh, that would be, he, it pro possibly would be enough for him for the time being to say, yeah, the special military operation, everything we suffered, it was all worth it because we've now got what we want in Ukraine. And, and ideally, of course, he'd, um, he'd probably either take Kiev or bring down the government in Kiev, which could be a consequence of, you know, of major Russian success. That could see the government fall in Kiev potentially, which is, again, something that he would, he would like to see happen, of course. Is there a possibility that us in the West are underestimating Putin's forces and the Russian armed forces' capability in this offensive? It's, it's quite easy to, to, to look at the way the war has unfolded so far and say the Russians just can't do it. And I've seen many experts and commentators and retired generals and the like suggesting that, that they just can't, you know, they've shown they can't do it. I hope that's true. I, I have heard from various different sources that the Russians have um, learnt quite a few lessons, and they should have done, from what's happened in Ukraine so far and have been trying to put them right. They've also, as we know, they've, they've boosted their manpower. They lost, if we, if we estimate that they've lost, say, 100,000 plus, 
of the troops they initially invaded with and, and additional reinforcements they've had since. Um, and, and whether that's deaths or, or overall casualty figures, we don't know. But, but they, you know, they, they've, the, the original force has been written down quite a bit. But they've more, they've replaced that and significantly more, I think at least 300,000 and there are estimates three to 500,000 mobilized with more mobilization. I think in, in the coming uh, days, I think Putin will be announcing additional mobilizations. But what that means is he's got huge numbers of troops compared to what he started with and compared to Ukraine, because while we're talking about this, of course, Ukraine's numbers have been badly written down they've been mobilizing, they've been reinforcing as well, but the balance is not there. And there's many more to come from the Russians. Uh, and on top of that, I think the, the um, you know, the, this battle winner artillery, Russians have been manufacturing that in huge numbers. And that will come into play as well. They've got plenty more tanks where they, you know, where the other ones came from as well. So, so they're stockpiling men, they're stockpiling resources. Yeah. And, 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 Things like precision missiles, they, they, they are running out of, and they're much more difficult to regenerate. Um, I think, again, Iran is, is looking at providing them with ballistic missiles. I'm not sure how reliable they're going to be, and more, more drones. But, but other than Iran and perhaps North Korea, the, the, the sources of Russian munitions really come from within Russia itself and the factories that are working around the clock to build them up again. Um, so if you take all of those things together and... and uh, I think it's for me. It's quite hard to see how Ukraine can prevail, and you know the the Russian the the upcoming Russian offensive, if it, if it occurs, may be very very costly for Russia. It may it may look really bad, but I I I have a nasty suspicion it could grind on and on and on, and result in in Putin at least achieving something. So I think we'd be. You know, I, as I say, I, I hope I'm wrong about this, but I think we would be unwise to um, to underestimate the Russian capability. And in particular, I think one one real concern that I have is that if Russia does make gains in this significant gains in this uh, upcoming offensive, that the West begins to lose kind of confidence in Ukraine and begin and you know it's tough enough already persuading people in various different countries in Europe and the US to keep supplying Russia, to keep pumping money and munitions into Russia. And particularly, I think the US is beginning, the, the figures for supporting Ukraine are shifting and in Europe. And the danger is that if Ukraine is seen to be losing, people, I think the West could lose heart. And I think that's, that would be a real devastating situation. I think it's really important in this current situation that we actually increase rather than reduce our support. How concerned are you about escalation from Russia? If the West continues to provide weaponry, and in particular, if we can, if we provide even more advanced weapons or, you know, airplanes and things like this. Yeah, I think I think you know Putin would like us to be very concerned about escalation, and he's obviously threatened nuclear in various different ways, threatened nuclear use, whether it's in Ukraine or against the West. We, he's not been specific, but. Um, I think we should take that seriously. We shouldn't. We shouldn't just say, "Well, he's not going to do that," because, frankly, we don't know what he's going to do. Um, so we should be prepared for that, and I hope we are prepared for that. When I say we, I mean our, our governments and our militaries. Um, but, but I think it's probably. I think it's unlikely that Putin will want to confront directly confront the West military at the moment, um, and and. The reason I say that is because you know NATO is, dis despite its shortcomings, is quite a powerful organisation, predominantly America. I mean, most of the other armies in Europe are not what they should be, but America's still got significant power. And I think um, Putin would be, particularly in the current situation with the Ukraine war, would be hesitant to want to take on the to take on NATO and to draw NATO into the conflict. So I, I'm not overly. I, we shouldn't kind of dismiss it, but I'm not overly concerned that that's going to happen right now. And, and, and I think, you know, one, one, um, one, one sort of slight caveat to that is that, you know, Putin, Putin will have seen, he will have seen the, 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 the effect on the West that we mentioned before of, um, of this conflict and the unifying effect, the strengthening of NATO in many ways.
uh, and he will want to probably do something about that. And, and so perhaps not now, but in the future, depending on how the Ukraine war unfolds, it would not be, in my view, beyond uh, possibility that he, he scores, let's say he scores a big success in Ukraine of some sort, time passes, and then he decides to undermine NATO even further. Of course, a success for Putin in Ukraine is very damaging for NATO anyway, but he wants to undermine NATO even further and th therefore, you know, takes a bite at NATO, perhaps, a NATO country. And for example, you know, by securing the corridor to, to Kaliningrad through NATO territory. And my concern there would be um, whether or not if, if he did do have, carry out some kind of aggression against a NATO, military aggression against a NATO country in the east, whether NATO as a whole is going to respond. And, and everyone says to me, of course NATO is going to respond, it's in the Charter, um, they've, they've got to do it, but I, that doesn't mean they will do it. And I think he might calculate along those lines that, you know, is Germany, France, Britain likely to send their soldiers to go and fight and die for some unknown piece of Eastern Europe? And if Britain, France, Germany aren't going to do that, is the US going to do it? Well, on that last point, I, I think there's a big debate, particularly in America, over uh, in the Republican side of, of the political aisle, over how much aid America should be giving to Ukraine. And on that point about sending American boys, GIs, you know, to, to fight in a foreign war thousands of mm. miles away, is that desirable? Obviously, it's not. Is there, a, is there a will from the American public to do that? No. Potentially not. I don't know, you know. So that I want to just throw a few arguments at you from, from, from their perspective and mm. see how you respond. So, for example, they say that we should be focusing our resources, our money on America and American citizens first. Why should we be funding this government in Ukraine? They particularly um, criticise Zelensky and say that his government is in part corrupt and there are issues with banning various um, political parties and um, sort of authoritarianism and then sometimes they make comparisons between Putin's Russia and Ukraine in terms of corruption and things like that, a sort of moral comparison. Um, and of course this issue of, of a third world war, of nuclear war, you know, they, every, we should try and do everything we can to prevent that from happening. That would be a total catastrophe for the world and for the West and you know, there are economic issues as well. So isn't it more desirable for a political end to this war, even if it causes problems for Ukraine, if they have to lose some territory, it's much better for us all to, um, to, to have peace as soon as possible and therefore you know, we should be applying pressure on Zelensky to, for example, sign a peace agreement rather than send him you know, endless military aid. Yeah, and I think that I, I've had these discussions in America with many, uh, many people, and I've heard that perspective many times. Probably more more that perspective than you know the opposite point of view, uh, and I can fully understand it. And it's you know it's 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 um, it's not an unreasonable position to take it unless you consider, as I do, that this this Ukraine is not so much a war against Ukraine. Okay, that's this this kind of um, against Russia. No, against Ukraine, it's 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 not you know there's ideological and historical and legacy reasons for Ukraine for Putin to want Ukraine, but I think beyond that it's a war against the West, it's a war against the United States of America, which is Putin's number one enemy, and and we've seen that exhibited in so many different places. Um, so if you if you say you know okay let him win it because putting pressure on Zelensky, the only the only outcome of that is that Putin wins. You know the pressure is not going to be for Zelensky to, 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 to keep it keep attacking. It's going to be for him to basically surrender, pretty much surrender to the Russians, um, and and that is that is a defeat for the West. If you know particularly, even, even you know even if we hadn't invested so much effort, and so many financial and military resources into that war, um, I think it still would be a defeat for the West. Uh, to Why? Be, to, for, for, for basically, for, because a, you know, a, a, in the twenty first century, a country decides to, without you know, against against the the rules that we're, we we think we're working on, decides to just take another country or, or a large chunk of it, and that's you know that under and, and in Europe, and that under I think that really does undermine the West and undermines the United States authority. And so I think um, 
I, th I think if you know if you, if you don't accept that, fine. If you don't think this is a major, uh, you know, geopolitical movement, a war between the West and Russia, I think fine. You you can say let's uh, you know as many Americans do, you can say let's let them let them be defeated. Um, but the, the other and the other thing, I think that's a, a an important um, factor. But the other thing, of course, is as I mentioned, I believe that the um, the attack in Ukraine came uh, as a direct consequence of our withdrawal from Afghanistan. And we have to worry about what China's thinking. And if China sees the West defeated in Europe, then to what extent does that embolden China? Because if, you know, Americans see things and, and some Europeans see things in different lights, but, you know, you might, you might argue if you're President Xi that if America doesn't care enough about its European allies um, to, to 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 fight to the end to keep them keep you know to to maintain the international order and maintain the sovereignty of a country that's been invaded in a war of aggression. Then you know why would they do it in somewhere like Taiwan? I, th I think you know that all of these things can't be looked at in isolation. I think they have to be looked at in in, in a wider picture as well. So that's, uh, I suppose, the opposite uh, argument, argument would be that um, thinking from realpolitik perspective that the practical implications of continue, continuing the war um, outweigh the sort of moral defeat that allowing, as you say, a sovereign country to be invaded by, mm. by another country mm. would entail. So it's a sort of, I suppose it's looking at it either from, from a practical perspective and from mm. a moral perspective. Yeah. And, 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 and the moral, I think, the, you know, the, you, you can certainly argue both ways, but I, I go back to the point I made before that if you're prepared to surrender your principles um, and your, I would say, responsibilities, then in this country, then you, you know, let's uh, uh, aggressors elsewhere are going to see that the ground is open for them, and and I think you know, obviously China in particular, but also countries like Iran, countries like North Korea. Um, other, other, you know, other people, other countries which are diametrically opposed to the West, and you're you're basically surrendering to them. And it, 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 it it's not. There's no, you know, no good comparisons particularly. But you know, look at what happened with Poland and Czechoslovakia um, uh, in in the early days of the Second World War, um, and what the consequences of that were, what the consequences of appeasement are, and and I think you know the. We seem to some extent to have learnt the lesson from that, but I think we, we um, you know, we, we, we need to, to reinforce, I think, that perspective to avoid a kind of do domino effect that might result from us being defeated in Ukraine. And just one last question. Are there limits, do you think there should be limits on the amount of aid we do give to Ukraine or the type of military aid and assistance that we're giving to Ukraine? So, for example, if we give them... Um, enough resources to take back Crimea, that could lead to a major escalation as obviously Putin would see that as such a humiliation for him. This could cause, you know, could cause him to make rash decisions. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think we should, you know, obviously there are limits to what we can do. I mean, there's practical limits. In the, we don't have unlimited resources, whether it's financial or military. So, but, but I believe we should supply Ukraine with what they need to fight this conflict um, and, and to uh, preferably, and it's not necessarily achievable, I've, you know, I've suggested earlier on that, that it may be that Putin's going to prevail here, but we should give them the resources that they need, as, that we can give them to, to resist and to, and to at least try and get to the stage of the somewhere around the February 2022 uh, start point. But if you, you mentioned Crimea, the, the only way to, to enable Ukraine to take Crimea is for NATO to do it. It's not, Ukraine does not have the capability to take Crimea. Whatever we give them, they don't have, we'd have to give them our navies as well, as well as weapons, because, because if you look at the map, Crimea cannot be taken without a, a pretty strong naval uh, capability, and, and they don't have that, aside from many other things. So I, I would, I mean, my view, and it's, it, you know, maybe it's illogical, I don't know, but my view would be that as a general uh, strategic goal, we should aim to restore the situation as it was in February 2022. Um, 
and 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 not not attempt to go beyond that either by going into Russian territory uh, or indeed into into Crimea. Thank you so much, Richard. Appreciate your time. My pleasure.